Alrighty, so I have had this bike now for a bit over 12 months. I actually have filmed a review on this bike when I was up at Craig's Hut, but um, there was that many flies, like horse flies, march flies, just biting me left, right and centre. I'm just doing this throughout the whole video. And um, I'll put up on the screen now, like what I actually filmed. Just didn't, like now a little fly, um, didn't turn out very well. So I thought I'll just do it when I come home. We'll go through it properly. What I like, what I don't like about the bike, um, I'll give you a little bit of a look into it now. There's not much I don't like about the bike. If I you know, didn't like parts about the bike, I've either changed it or I would have sold the bike. That's how things normally work. All right, so if you're thinking, I'm gonna watch this, see what the opinion is, and he says to buy it, I'm gonna go buy it. Don't. Same as any other video or anything you see on TV, if a person says, you must go buy this, don't. Make your own opinion up. Just because one person says this is the best thing they've ever had, might not be for you. So that's why I don't even read like Google reviews or anything anymore. If I wanna go check something out, I'll go check it out. Make my own opinion. All right, so firstly, let's go through what I've actually changed on the bike. If you're new to the channel, I've got a whole bunch of videos since I purchased this bike, what I've done with the bike, a few places that I've been, including the big trip that I did up to Cape York and back. Now, we'll start at the front. So at the front, just before I went to Cape York, I purchased a headlight protector. Common sense, um, mainly because there's some rocks up there. If you get stuck behind a truck or whatever, they'll flick up and the price of those headlights is not that cheap. So it's a good thing to have, especially for daylight riding. Nighttime riding, it can affect it a little bit. So your headlight is a little bit restricted. Uh, I don't plan on doing lots of night riding. If it gets to that stage, you put auxiliary lighting on. That's just how it is. So coming forward a little bit, we've got the EvoTech nav mount with the Garmin navigator there. Uh, that works great, does its job. I've got a video on how to wire it all in, that sort of thing. Coming a bit further forward, um, I just use a quad lock wireless charger for my phone. Uh, that keeps it going. It um, depends on your phone. Uh, so if you've got like a nav sort of recording app going, so like um, Gaia or something like that, it, it can't really keep up with your phone. So you will see the battery of your phone drop if you're just using the wireless charger. Um, if you're just running off a map, like viewing it, works perfectly fine. It's only I've noticed if you've hit record and you're trying to record the track. But apart from that, works great for everyday use, what I'd use it for. Um, I've changed over to a Scott steering dampener. Um, that thing is worth its weight in gold, essentially, and figuratively, because they are not cheap. Um, it's paired up with the Muller or Miller um, mount, which come from Prague or Czech Republic, around there, around one of the city there somewhere. Um, that works really, really well. The OEM one, um, once it starts getting hot, especially if you're in the sand, it just heats up and becomes completely useless. Come a bit further back. Um, so on the bike, you'll notice we've got the factory um, crash bars and dash plate upgrades. Uh, they are really, really good. Um, a lot of people do have the problem of if you get a lot of strong wind or if you're going above a certain speed limit, um, you can get a lot of vibration through them. Uh, you can if it's not torqued correctly. So just make sure your torque settings are correct and you've put this bolt into the correct torque spec because otherwise you'll get a lot of vibration out of the engine. Uh, I've got a video on that also. And yes, you put the Loctite on, you tighten it up, you let it set, and then you put the crash bars on. Otherwise you're over torquing it. So just go with that. Um, we'll come a bit further back. If you've got a, uh, any sort of soft luggage, Good thing to have some sort of luggage carrier to keep it off the exhaust. These are the Sherpa ones by Nomad ADV. Uh, when I was looking at getting these for the bike, there wasn't a lot around. Um, I like the look of the, the B&B ones now that they have, especially at the back section here, uh, but they just didn't have them when I was getting this ready to go last year. Uh, since I come back from Cape York, a few changes. So I changed the spring rate so I put an eye-back spring in there, I've just upped it a little bit, um, just to get that initial weight rather than it sinking down. I am gonna look at doing the suspension later on, but that's good enough for the time being. And I've put a full SC Project DCAT exhaust on, 
no baffle, uh, which means you need some sort of fuel management, otherwise it runs way too lean. So I've got the Rapid Evo fuel management ECU, which sort of sits underneath the pillion seat here. Um, once again, got a video on that, so check that out. And then probably the biggest upgrade and the most expensive upgrade I've done is the Bart's tubeless wheels. Wasn't really planning on doing that, but when I dinged the front rim and it wasn't worth buying a full wheel set for the front from Ducati, paid a little bit extra and got a lot stronger set uh, from Italy, which, um, yes, it's expensive, but it's definitely worth it. Not only are you getting stronger wheels, you're getting stronger spokes. The Kush drive converts to uh, the KTM style. So the KTM rubbers for the Kush drive are a bit cheaper and they're more readily available when it comes to changing that sort of thing out. Okay, so let's get into what I really like about the bike. It just does everything that I want. Okay, so when I was first looking for a bike, I was set on getting the, the Yamaha World Raid. That's what I wanted. And then they released the price and I'm like, that's not what I want anymore. And I was, looked around at something which I thought was actually out of my price range. And it was this. It worked out to be cheaper than the World Raid. So yeah. What are the benefits of this? Straight away, you get cruise control. You get a quick shifter. You've got all your ECU um, power maps and braking maps and cornering and ABS. You can turn on and off. And no matter what mode you have it set in, if you turn the bike off and turn the bike back on, it stays in that mode. That's only something certain models, <laughs> KTM, oh, did I, did I say that? Yeah, um, that they're, they're only getting around to do now, but you still need a special dongle to do it. Yeah. Now, there are a few issues that a lot of people that own these bikes have stated that they have problems with. It really does depend how you look at it. First of all, we'll go with the air filter. Oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention. I replaced to a uni filter, oiled filter in here as well before um, I went on the big trip. That thing works great. Once again, got the videos, check them out. Okay, to get to the air filter, fuel tank has to come off. Okay, it's not easy, but it is easy if you've done it multiple times. I find the easiest way is front windscreen off. Um, you can loosen the crash bars. I take the plastics off, because I normally give them a clean anyway. Um, and then earth strap off, have to take the uh, steering dampener off. And then there's a couple of bolts under there, there's a bolt under the seat. And then there's the air breathers on the side, which you have to disconnect. The air breathers on the side, there's one of them that can be a real pain in the bum. But I just, I've replaced that with a longer one. And I'll just put like a small cable tie down the bottom when I've thread it through. I just manually pull that out when I'm ready to take the tank off and that comes with the tank. It just makes life so much easier. So to get the tank on and off, um, I've got it down to about 10, 15 minutes and about another 10 minutes to replace the air filter. That's good and bad. It's good in that the air sucks in from a high spot and it sucks it in from reverse so it's not forcing all the dirty air in. It's actually pulling it backwards it's not sucking in air from down here under the wheel well or up down low here. It's just one of those things, that, you know, it's good and bad. If you were to drown the bike going through deep river crossings and that, yeah, it could be a bit of a nightmare to try and get everything out. I'm not into that sort of riding. I'd rather take a way around a river if I had to. Um, small river crossings are fine, but I'm not looking at pushing it so you have the water level, you know, coming up to here, bubbling the exhaust out just for some content on YouTube, which you do come across. So that side of things doesn't worry me. A couple of people have had um, collapsed tanks because the breathers have been stuck. Um, they've released uh, a fix where they've got like a, they've got like a ballpoint pen spring inside um, the hose to stop it kinking a certain way if you put the tank on incorrectly. I haven't had that problem. I've sort of just thread them through myself anyway, so. Yeah, not real an issue. Okay, so the rims. A lot of people have had spokes sort of crack around the outer of the rim. I never had that on the other ones, 
Um, I was trying to think how, I did what, 10,000 Ks on the other rims. I never had that issue, but I did have the issue where I noticed how soft they were with a bit of a, a front impact. So I dinted it and cracked it and that sort of thing. Um, yes, the rims could be a lot stronger on this bike. But with that upgrade, that has fixed it. Like, should you have to upgrade the rims, you know, on this bike with the amount of money to pay? I'll get to that a bit further down the track. But these rims are probably at least five times better than the OEM ones. Not only in strength-wise, but even getting the tyres on and off. Because these are a, a standard rim shape, you don't have all that um, outer rim to flick the tyres on and off. Yeah, oh, that's another thing as well. Upgrade the tyres. The Pirellis that come on this bike are good for road and maybe some solid like dirt track. But as soon as you start hitting gravel, mud, clay, they're no good, no good at all. So get a decent set of tyres on. I'm currently running a Motoz setup, Motoz Tractionator rear, dual venture on the front. Once they wear out, I'll look at what other options are available. Um, it's always good to try new things, but this is the current setup I have and it's working fairly well at the moment. So another issue some people are having are with the brakes. They're finding the rotors are warping, uh, they're not seated correctly, and you get like a lot of shudder uh, when you're coming down, especially on a, a slow speed coming up to a traffic light or a stop sign. You'll get it, like a lot of feedback through the bars. Haven't had that happen on this bike. Uh, yeah, I tend to use a, a lot of engine braking and then like when I'm going downhill, I'll be on the brakes, like off-road and that, but I'm not hitting any creeks or anything like that where the, where the brakes are hot and they can warp. So they're just gradually cooling down. So I've never come across that at all. So this bike's just over 20,000 Ks now. I've got all the kit to do, um, the maintenance for 20,000 Ks, which is what the book says. New front and rear sprocket, new chain, um, check the bearings and that sort of thing. So the bearings should be fine because these wheels have only done 5,000 Ks tops. So they're brand new bearings essentially. Uh, but I'm gonna do a bit of a comparison to see how much the actual sprockets have worn down. I don't think I would need to really replace the sprocket, but we're gonna check anyway. Um, the OEM chain that comes on these bikes, it's a Regina chain. That's one thing I'm a little bit disappointed about. It does stretch a fair bit. You, like after every 500 Ks, I'm sort of adjusting the chain on this bike seems to get a little bit more stretch each time. I thought it would be you know, a little bit more solid than what it is. So I am upgrading to a different brand chain when I change that over. Um, yeah, apart from that, the bike is going well. I've had a few questions, um, people, you know, how do you go with like roadworthies and stuff for the exhaust because it's so loud. It's actually not that loud um, when you're cruising along. And go and buy the EPA specs and that on the side. All right, so with the, the noise regulations, stamped on the frame, you've got 94 decibels at third gear doing 39 and a half kilometers an hour. That's where they take the reading from. Honestly, even with this open, it's probably close to that. So yeah, it's only if you really give it a bootful, you can hear it, which is fine, really. All right, so that's pretty much everything that I've changed on the bike. Still dripping after I washed it. Yep. Um, what I'll do now is in the next part of the video, I will um, put the bike together as if I'm going on a big trip. We'll go through everything that I carry and we'll have for my camp set up. And um, yeah, some people get ideas on what other people carry. I don't carry too much, uh, especially being on the bike. I've sort of taken my hiking set up and put it on the bike, plus a few other little things, like mainly maintenance things for the bike and that sort of thing. So uh, food-wise and that, I'm sort of sticking to like a, a hiking setup, which is dehydrated food and that sort of thing, mainly because you're on road a lot more on this and you come across places and you can easily pick something up along the way, unless you're going fully remote and then you have to look at other things. But we'll go through that and uh, some people might get some ideas and other people might go, no, how about you try this and try that, which I'm always up for. So, yeah.
currently, she's all going good.